Welcome everybody to a lunchtime lecture um, this April. We've got uh, Percy Makakaba, uh, who is a geologist at Namani Resources, uh, which is a mining arm of community invest in investment holdings. The company has coal mines and prospects in Vitbank and Waterberg coal fields. He is mostly involved in project feasibility studies and mine grade control. He holds an MSc in engineering mining and a BSc in honors in geology from the University of Varazhan. He is a GSSA member and, and a SACNAF scientific uh, candidate with, reg, uh, with candidate registration status. status. Uh, Percy's going to talk to us today a little bit about coal mining and, and pillar recovery, I think. Uh, Percy, do you want to share your screen and let's get your presentation up? Okay, thank you, Craig. Let me share the screen. Okay, looks good. Carry on, I'll mute myself. Okay, I think I was that. Thank you so much, Craig. And as you mentioned, I'm Pisi Makagawa and I'll take you through the talk titled An Evaluation of Extraction of Coal Pillars, a Case Study at Whitman Coalfield. So this is taken from my master's research report and I'll just take the introduction part from the report. So the content of my talk will focus on pillar extraction, the definition, the experience in South Africa. And I will also take you through an outline of the feasibility study that is used to see the viability of a pillar extraction project and the financial evaluation of that. And then I'll go through a case study and then I'll conclude. So what is pillar extraction? So basically pillar extraction is when we mine the pillars that were left as a roof support during room and pillar operation. So basically a room and pillar operation is when we mine a instead of rooms and leaving pillars as roof support to support the roof underground. So these pictures will illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, let me take a laser. So the first one is a room and pillar operation. The mining direction goes towards a vision ground. So here you have a CM mining a vision coal. A vision, I mean like a coal that has not been mined before. And then here you have uh, your shuttle car and your conveyor belt. And these are the pillars that I'm talking about. And the spaces in between are the rooms. So this is a pillar extraction operation. We see that the mining, uh, the mining direction is the opposite of our room and pillar operation. And here we're mining those pillars that were left as our roof support. And then you can see that in this case, we need roof support, artificial roof support, such as your mobile roof support, your roof boards and your timbers. And then we still have a CM, we still have your shuttle cars and your conveyor belt. And then the gob, this place called the gob is uh, the area where the extracted, the extracted, uh, the extracted pillars have caved in. So this is the area your roof has, has caved in and you have removed the pillars. So why do we do pillar extraction? For obvious reasons, we want to increase our recovery, you know, and we increase that by taking the, the, the coals that would have not been mined before. And those pillars, we can mine them using underground methods or open cast method. Uh, op an open cast method that have been used before is the one that has been used in at Newval Colliery at Free State. And this method is usually a high volume method and we expect high dilution and high intensity of spawn comb, spontaneous combustion. There are two approaches of pillar extraction. It's either, the first one is either you have old workings that were not planned or designed in a way to, to be extracted after to extract the pillars after you are done with the primary extraction. And the second approach is the one that during primary extraction as the, as the mining room and pillar methods, they've already taken into account that they want to mine those pillars, they want to retreat. As they retreat, they want to take those roofs. Uh, those 
pillars that are acting as roof support. As we continue, pillar extraction in South Africa, what has been the experience in South Africa? So as I mentioned that we do, we do pillar extraction because we want to increase the recovery. So um, the, the wheat bank, let me try to use here, thank you. So the, the, the wheat bank coal field has been depleted, has been depleted almost more than 50% of our resources at the wheat bank coal field has already been extracted. And that leaving the coal companies to explore the possibility of extracting those coal pillars. So the large areas in the wheat bank coal field have previously mined using room and pillar or board and pillar, leaving significant amount of coal left in pillars as roof support, as I mentioned before. So these are examples of the collaries that are mining the pillars. You know, you have the famous one, the New Denmark, the Seriti New Denmark, and you have the green side that used to be Anglo, but now it's Tungela, the Tikwandeni, you know, and a lot of examples. Uh, like I mentioned, the one New Val, Seriti New Val in Free State. So these are the companies that are mining using, uh, that are stopping or that are mining the pillars. So the history of pillar extraction. So pillar extraction in South Africa started in the late 70s to 80s. And then the, these are where the old mining method that we used. You have an open end system. So basically an open end system is the one where lifts or cards are taken adjacent to the gulf or the gulf area. So here you have your first lift or slice, second slice, which is adjacent to this gulf third, then fourth, then fifth, then six, like that, seven, you know. So the, the slides are, are taken through and they're just into the gulf. And then you have a pocket fender. Pocket fender is basically where you mine and you leave a portion of the pillar. That portion, we usually call it a fender. A fender is a portion of pillar that is left to support the roof. Then Usutu, Usutu is when we have a 45 degree stopping angle. You see, we mine the pillars from top end until all through until the bottom end. So this was the old method that we used in South Africa in the 1970s and 80s. And the current ones, uh, you have an angled card method and it's usually used for small pillars. You have a speed, split and fender, which is usually used for medium and large. So a medium pillar is the one that is uh, the width of 14 meters to, to 16, you know, and maybe it is also used for medium and large pillars. So this picture illustrates an angled cut. So an angled cut basically means you are taking your slices as a diagonal leaves or slices. Like you see one, two, three it's in uh, diagonals. Then here you have your support. So, you leave outside snooks. So snooks is those small, small portions of pillars that are left. They also they also offer support, roof support. So they're left on the outside, and then you take the middle portions. And then a split and fender is similar to a pocket fender. You leave a fender or a rib, and then you take ninety degree angle lifts or cuts in the pillar, and then this, these are also your roof support. So illustrate the differences between the method. And you see why an angled cut can apply in a small pillar and a split and fender can apply in a medium and large pillars. You know, you can't separate a small pillar into two portions. That means you're, not, you're basically not mining anything. And then we have the famous one that has been, uh, that has high success rate, successful rate. So you have a navy, we call it navy uh, method. So the navy method basically is you lift or you cut 45 degrees from your stopping line. So you see you have your 41, two, then three, then four. You have, you take 45 degrees angles. The reason why this has been very successful is because with this method, there is fast retreat of a CM in case of caving, in case the ground collapses, the CM can retreat retreat very fast compared to those other ones that I mentioned before and the old ones there, the open end and also to uh, methods. So the reason why is because there have been burials of CMs, of continuous mining, mining machines underground. So they needed a method that will allow fast retreat. 
in case of caving. And then we go into an outline. I'll briefly go through an outline so that we have time to go through our case study. So the feasibility of pillar extraction, we have a, a, a flow sheet. So there are things that we need to check. I know that this may not be visible, but I'll go through all, all those constraints and this constraints and uh, the, the mining methods. So you have your mining constraints, you have your rock engineering constraints, your environmental constraints, and your beneficiation constraints for you to choose a mine method and then to continue until you get into financial evaluation. So this is very important because as I've, as I've said, you are removing roof support. That means that method should be dangerous because you don't have support for your roof. Right before I go into the mining constraints and rock engineering constraints, I thought I should start at geology because you can't mine without knowing your geology. Basically, geology dictates everything. So the very important thing in a mining in a pillar extraction operation is the system. You need to know what kind of system you're mining. Is it a steep system or a soft system? And that is dictated by your geology, your roof strata, what kind of rocks do you have? You have the depth of the scenes, you know, are they deep, are they shallow? Are uh, your structures, do you have your folds, your joints, you know? So we see here on this table, we have a stiff system is the one that is stable and controlled, you know, and a soft system is the violent and uncontrollable one, right? And we see this one is usually the deep mines and this one is the shallow mines, the soft system is the shallow mines. And then the competent roof, you know, the, your dolerite rocks, if, if your roof is a dolerite or a massive sandstone, an incompetent roof is when you have your shales, your clays, or even your coal as a roof. And we know that your roof is not competent, can break anytime. Sometimes they call it a weak roof, right? Then you have a, a massive rock mass and a jointed rock mass for obvious reasons I've mentioned, you, the structures dictate what kind of system you have so that you can know whether to leave squat pillars or your fenders and smiths. Okay, we get into that flow sheet. We'll start with rock engineering. Rock engineering will look at the safety risk, uh, the extraction ratio, the seam interaction, and factor of safety. I'll go through them one by one. So the safety risk, as I mentioned a couple of times, you are removing your roof support, those pillars that are providing support. So this should be a high risk mine, high risk mining method. You know, and the typical rock fall related is that you will have in such a mining method at the large folds of ground, you know, you have uh, your large folds of ground can be characterized into uh, your small scale and your large scale. But I'll, I'll talk more on that as we progress. So there will be stability issues or stability risk associated with this method. So you have, and the stability risk factors are really dependent on your pillar design. If you have a good pillar design, usually you won't have these this failures. So we have a pillar squeeze, which happen when the pillars are too small to support the load applied to them. Then you, your pillar will squeeze. And we see that this will lead to closure of entries or exits, you know, severe rip spelling, flow heave. Flow heave is when your floor, your floor rises, you know, can close in or roof failure when your roof collapses. Then you have massive collapse, which sorry, which result from pillar failures where we have low width to height ratio, low width of the pillar, the width and the pillar, you know, when your width is very small, width to height ratio is very small, you have your massive collapses, and that will result in destructive air blast because we uh, a mining and underground operation is a very confined area. So imagine having a very destructive air blast. A lot of people can lose their life or be injured. Then you have a pillar bump, which happened in, uh, this one is mostly experiencing uh, very deep mines. And it's like a, a normal rock vest. Those who work in deep mines, they know a normal rock vest. They usually have those. But this, in this case, is a pillar, the whole pillar bursts, you know, and this can injure a lot of people or kill a lot of people. Other factors that we look at, that are associated with the safety, the roof geology. You know, when you have a weak roof geology, when you have a weak roof strata, 
like your shields, your milestone, your coal, uh, the, 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 the roof is bound to fracture under high stresses. So in this case, you require a very high level of roof support. You need to have a lot of roof bolts and mobile roof support and your timbers that were used in the past. An intersection span, similar to the first point that I mentioned, when, when you have large intersection span and your roof is weak, you have those collapses. Intersection span is basically where your, your, your pillar intersects, your, where, where the roads intersect uh, in the underground operation. And the, the depth of the cover, so we, as I mentioned, the pillar bumps, when, when your, your seams are at a deeper, you know, when your seams are deep, you will, you will have high stresses, high vertical stress and high horizontal stresses. And in such cases, we expect a lot of pillar beds and a lot of uh, ground, uh, a lot of caving in those circumstances. Then you have multiple seams, for example, in the wood bank, those work like in the wood bank, where you have number two seam on top of number one seam you find that they are both or they're concurrently mined or they're mined at the same time. You find that uh, number two seam is mined using open cast and number one is mined using underground methods. So you find that as they're blasting, uh, they're blasting number two seam and you expect to mine number one seam at a later stage, that may have issues for you because already the roof is already blasted and you have cracks and you have those stresses that have formed. And then you have recovery of all pillars, you know, before technology, before the advancement of expertise, you find that people are having the practicing poor methods of mining and poor methods of designing. So you find that there are different sizes of pillars and different shapes of pillars in those circumstances when you want to mine them at the later stage, you might have problems. Same with the second point, non-uniform pillar dimensions will have large intersection spans. Okay, factor of safety. This kind of factor of safety means how much the strength of a, an object to carry the load applied to it. In this case, the strength of the pillar is the speed, the pillar strong enough to, to to hold the load applied to it. So we have a formula that we use to calculate the effect of safety. The effect of safety must be greater than 1.6 for you to, to even start anything. If it's below 1.6, we stop. We you stop your, your feasibility study, you don't continue. So we see here, this study was done by Cotec 2020. We see the more, the, the lesser your effect of safety, the more probable of having pillar collapses. Like this is one in a, this is one in a million, and this is 1,500 in a million. You see there's an exponential increase when you pass 1.6, it's 5.3 in 1.5 and 17,000 in 1.4. So when your, when your factor of safety is more than 1.6, you stop. And your width to high should be greater than two. If it's not, you stop, okay? Your mining constraints, you're talking about your mining method, your, your resource and reserve estimate and your ROM. So we have a flow sheet for the mining method. We have four mining methods. Either you do mine the pillar, all of it, or you mine using checkerboard. Checkerboard, you, you leave every second pillar or you take 50% of the pillars and the ones that remain, they will provide roof support. Then you have pillar splitting, what I was explaining with uh, the method that I was that were used before, and even the current method, your navy, your angled cut, and your split and fender, with a pillar splitting and pillar cutting, right? So these are the constraints that we look at for us to choose a mining method. And even as a resultant of those mining methods, what are we gonna have as your, your cost and your safety, you know, from each and every mining method? They dictate the safety, they dictate the environment, they dictate, the beneficiation or the processing of coal or the washing of coal. So your, your mineral resource and reserve estimate. So basically, our, basically we, we had, uh, you have a mine plan and you have the pillar. So from the, pillar, from the mine plan, you can get the area of the pillar and the thickness of the seam. Then you have volume. 
and from the volume you multiply by the row density, which we usually get from our boreholes, borehole data. So you will have your tonnage, right? So we use SAMREC. I think most of geologists are familiar with this term, but if you're not SAMREC in South African mineral reporting codes, it helps us to, to report our tonnages. So we use SAMREC to report our tonnage. So this is, uh, this is, you start from GTS, GTS is gross tons in situ, which is what's there on the ground. Then you have to factor the old workings, you have to factor the geological losses and possible modeling errors, then you get a total tons in situ. And then your total tons in situ, you have to factor out your mining loss because you're, for example, let's say you are using a, a checkerboard. Checkerboard is taking only 50%. So you have to take to factor that in every mining method that you're using, you have to either subtract, yeah, yes, you're subtracting, you're subtracting how much of the resource you, you'll be actually mining. When you mine tons in situ, you have to factor in your, con your contamination and your dilution. Are you usually this we do this when we are over mining you? You're mining a portion above your scene, which is usually the case because there's a certain mining height that you have to reach for, for people to be able to work underground. Then ROM, ROM is either you you sell it as it is, you crush and sell it as it is, or you wash it. We call it washing is our processing. It's either you wash it so that you reach certain spec or certain speculation, your client speculation. So when you wash it, you will have a, a loss that you, there'll be a loss. There's code that you're going to lose during that process of washing your code. Then you have to factor that out for you to get a sellable. That's what we used for, for our study. Environmental constraints include surface subsidence, groundwater, and spontaneous combustion. So because we are taking the pillars, we expect to have surface subsidence, right? Because there'll be caving, there'll be caving of, of the roof strata. So there are types of surface subsidence. You have sinkholes, you have continuous disturbances or discontinuous disturbances. And these are affected by the factors like your seam thickness. How thick is your seam? If your seam is very thick, then you have very high subsidence. You know, the distance between the seam extraction ratio, the more you extract, the more caving you expect. Your faults and joints for obvious reasons. When you have faults, we know that we'll have cracking and we'll have we we possibly gonna have uh, the caving of the roof strata. You know the type of strata is it compact, competent roof strata or the one that's not the weak one? And then the depth of mining is it deep? Is it shallow? The deeper it is, the the higher chance of subsidence. And you will see. You know the deeper it is, the lower chance of subsidence, and the lower effect of subsidence that we'll see on this surface. Then the groundwater, you know, we expect, if, when you're mining underground, you expect fluctuation of water pressure, expect watering of strata, you know, your effect to your aquifers, right? And your water quality, because coal, you have your methane gas and all those gases that are found in the structure of coal. Then we, we expect the water quality to deteriorate. So the reason, for this picture, I'm showing you a PCD. So mines are required to have PCD. A PCD is a pollution control dam. So the water that is pumped out of an underground working is more disposed to the environment. It must be pumped into a PCD, a dam, so that it can be purified before it can be disposed. And then you have a spontaneous combustion, the last one, which is actually is basically the the fire that is caused when oxygen reacts with coal. And then we know that it will affect our resources, we'll lose coal and it will cause pollution. Uh, it will affect the water qualities as well. Then we have beneficiation or beneficiation. Beneficiation constraints basically means that is your plant designed in a way that can take more coal or can take the required coal, you know, your tannages. The coal quality raw, the geology one, and the waste quality, you know. Coal, the, the, what do we, we measure as coal quality is we measure ash, ash which the, the higher the ash in coal, the, the, the 
better the lesser quality it is high cv better quality high volatile better quality low moisture better quality low sulfur better quality because sulfur has environmental issues you know. so we have a market requirements you know we don't just sell coal there's a speculation that a certain market will require for the, for you to to sell to them they'll require a certain spec that they can buy your coal so escom has a spec like identified to 33 ish so, so we have a spec 2029 and then you have domestic coal specification. I didn't put export one because of space, but yes, and you see there's A grade, B grade, and all of them have a certain specification. And then, uh, for example, I still say I need A grade, then you need to see that your A grade is 15, then you have to make sure that your coal is 15 to if you, you have to wash it to 15. So uh, how do how they do it is to do to run a washability test to see at what density they will get a certain edge. So this diagram shows us the densities and the qualities. So in this case, they just showed edge and edge shield and your sulfur content. But usually it's edge and your CV because those are the most important thing. And when, as you watch edge, automatically your, your sulfur will be controlled. So we see at lower densities, which is usually, which is the case, the case that, the lower the density, the better the quality, the, the lower the edge, because I said that your, for your code to be of a better quality, it means it has lower edge content, right? So we see that as you increase the density, your edge also increases and we don't want that, right? So usually they use 1.6, depending on your code, this, does not, this is not a graph that applies to all code quality. You know, I mean, this is just an example. But depending on, on your coal, you will see whatever as you want and at whatever density. So they run this LA lab to make it's called a washability test so that you can see at what edge percentage you need to, to wash, at what density you need to wash to get a certain edge percentage. I'm not going to do it on this because of time. Then we go on financial evaluation. We have a call, we have this is somebody we use somebody because. Sunrise is the equivalent of SAMREC. So SAMREC is the South African Mineral Asset Valuation Code. And then we have three approaches. Uh, it's cost, it's income, and market approach. So a cost approach is the one way the amount of capital that you used, you use that to value a project, which usually does not reflect, it's not, it's not always the true. So use cost approach when we don't have other options, when the information that we have does not support us to use income or market. So income is the one that is usually preferred and is effective and it's the one that I use for this project. So income, you, you, you calculate cash flows and then you discount them to reflect a future, to, to reflect future cash flows so that you can know the value of the project. Market is similar to, to the cost, you use what is there on the market, like you actually compare to, to all body, you compare all bodies. If this value, if this all body has this value and is similar to ours, we can, we can value ours using that all body, which is usually doesn't apply because all bodies are not, they will never be the same and all body is unique, right? So Cost and market, they are very applicable on precious metals. They are used on precious metals, but for coal, they don't really make sense to use them. Then uh, I used income, as I mentioned before, and I calculated NPV, which is a net present value, which refers to the sum of the present values of all yearly cash flows, right? And then you have an internal rate of return, which this can you measure the risk associated with the project. And then you also have your payback period, which is the amount of years it will take you, or amount, the duration that it will take you for you to recover the money you already used in your project. Okay, you need this to do your cash flow. So you need your production schedule. How much are you gonna produce per month if you are doing it per month? Or how much are you producing per year? And then you need to know your products and you know every, as I mentioned, every spec or every market has a certain price to their coal. The better the quality, the higher the price. You know? So cap capex, which is capital expenditure, is the those 
your missionaries, the, the expenditure or the expenses that you need as you are starting a mine or that you need before operation. You know, your pumps and pumping your electricity, your support, even during the operation can have CapEx. CapEx basically is uh, your machines and your support, your electricity, your belt and your belt structure. So I, I used underground uh, examples. You know, your plant, if you don't have a plant, you have to construct a plant or other components within the plant, that's CapEx. And OPEX is either operating costs, you know, paying people, paying salaries, paying electricity, logistics of it, you know, paying water, you know, paying the plant operating costs like your magnetite and all those things. Then you, this is your discounted cash flow. This is your resultant cash flow, which is your revenues, the amount of money that you get, right? Minus your costs, you know, your capex, your opex, your royalty rate is basically the the money that you pay, it's like tax that you pay for a certain mineral because the minerals belong to the government, it's the custodian. So you pay a tax, you pay a royalties. So it's usually 5% for the fine, one defined and 7% for the fine. No, 5% for refining, um, 7% for undefined. Code is undefined, so it's 7%. Case, the, case study of finance funding, I know I've been dragging before we got here, but I'll. It's not a lot of parts. It's not a lot of parts here, so I'll just go through. So finance funding is in the Whitburn Coalfield, as I mentioned before. It's in Tua Town. It's the western limit of the Whitburn Coalfield. It's one of the Namani operations. The mining here began in 1981, and they were using open cast method to mine your number two C, and then uh, underground methods to mine your number one seam. So the black is number one seam workings, all the workings, and the gray is number two seam, you know? So they were mining at the same time. And then the life of mine of, of number one, or the life of mine of the underground workings stopped in, ended in 2018. So we see here that we have portions where the number two overlies number one. And I mentioned that, that this can be a problem. So already it was number one problem. And then we have our stratigraphy. This is our general stratigraphy of the mine. And my focus would be number one thing because this is the one that was extracted using underground methods. So above it, we can see that it's overlaying by sandstone, which means that it's a competent roof, it's a stiff system already, then we have a tick. And then here, we're doing our rock engineering. We wanted to find the uh, factor of safety, sorry, factor of safety, the width to height ratio, uh, your pillar sizes. You wanted to find out your extraction ratios. So we divided our, our, our operation into blocks, areas, depending on the depth, depending on the structures there, and the thickness of the coal seam. Okay, this are, these are the results that we have. I, I could not put all the 70, the 40 areas that I chose that are just to, to illustrate. So here we see we have places where our width to height ratio is smaller than two, which is a red flag. And we have a factor of safety here, which is more than three, which is good. Then we have a pillars, you know, both width, which are the spaces in between. Then we have a center. This shows the size of our pillars. And this is our area of extraction. It means they're already extracted 72 and we're left with 80% on the ground or 39.8 on the ground. So this, are, this is the summary of the information we got from engineering. As I mentioned, we have a competent roof. So it means less roof support to be required. We will have controllable failures. And then this is the depth of the seam is 25 meters on average. The factor which is about three or with to high ratio is three by the parts where the portions where it's even less, less than three, it's less than two. So we have to decide from that information what many methods can be used. 
So it makes sense for us to use check about for the reasons that we that the our scene, as much as it's a very stiff system, but our scene is shallow. It means that when the ground begins to collapse or when the roof caves, we'll have subsidence, we'll have surface subsidence. <clears throat> if we carry out full extraction, we'll have surface subsidence, and we don't need, we don't want that. And then we the areas as, as I've shown you that have low height, low width to height of the of the pillar. So we know that we'll have pillar failures that can result to massive uh, fatalities or massive injuries, or we can have barriers or burials of our machine CM, you know. And then also the, the other reason why we choose checkerboard is that checkerboard, as I mentioned before, you're mining every second pillar. So you, you mine this pillar, you leave the other one as support, you mine, you know, like that. So it means there'll be less capital used or less, less capital requirement. Even the operators, you don't need to. She's she's Sorry. So. Sorry. So we don't need to train our operators. Our operators, we don't. They are not required uh, intense training as compared to pillar splitting. You know, as pillar splitting, we are speaking about forty-five degrees angles. So it requires an operator that is very skilled, you know, for them to be able to, to meet those requirements needed by those particular methods. So your MTIS that I mentioned from some, some rec will be 50% of TTIS because we're just many 50% of the pillars. Beneficiation, this, this second last slide, so bear with me. Beneficiation, so we use the washability test to see that the quality that can meet our primary market and secondary market, how much like the yield that will be required. So we, we got that 60% of our resources will go to the primary market, will meet the spec of the primary market and 40% can be sent to our secondary market because of because of uh, disclosure and you know those legalities, I can't disclose which is our primary market and which is our secondary market. But I think if you people can already tell that, yeah. So checkup board has less subsidence, as I mentioned, so less environmental problems. We'll have additional PCDs that will be required uh, because already we'll be pumping water from underground. That that, that underground operation has been closed for years. So we have, we have a lot of flooding happening there. So we have to pump out water and we have to prepare. When a checkup board has little or to no effect on our water table, because already you're not taking everything out, will still be pillars that will be left. Uh, this is our last slide and I will conclude. Uh, because we will have less capital costs, because we already have the, the plant to expand on the mine, you know, you have roads, you have offices already. So it's just like an extensional project. So there's less capital costs required. And then your NPV, which is your net present value, is high and your IR is high, which means that your risk is very low and your payback period is short. So you are getting your returns and you're getting the money that you've used for, for capital. Is so to conclude, so as I mentioned before, I conclude, I can't disclose certain like figures because, because of the platform, but I just had to summarize that, you know, the profit and all that. So thank you. To conclude, pillar extraction is very enticing, you know, uh, as much as you won't have high capital cost, Already, you like you are you are increasing your recovery, um, and you can those those men that are already coming to a close or their the life of men is coming to a close can already increase the life of men and all that. But you we can't avoid that there are safety issues associated with pillar extraction, especially if we don't follow uh, we don't follow that flow diagram that I told you, and we don't pay attention to very important. Aspect, you know, like as David Caesar said in Call Safety 2022, he said that uh, operations that were not planned to mine or they did not design the operations to mine secondary extraction or to mine the pillars should not do so. 
because there was an incident, I think Cold Brook incident that people, a lot of people know, that 500 people were trapped underground, you know. So if we just mind, because we just want to increase our recovery, we want to increase our reserves or resources, or want to do it because already you have capital, already you have plans, already you have offices, you end up risking the lives of men and women that are working for you. So it's really that it's really as much as there are risk that people are willing to take the risk, but um, you can't avoid the risk associated with the pillar extraction. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Percy. Um, there was an interesting talk. And I must confess, I don't know much about um, filler extraction in, in, in mining operations in general, but it sounds like it's a pretty scientifically robust and engineering um, robust calculations that have to be done to do this properly. Uh, are there any questions from, there's a couple people in the audience. Uh, are there any questions or comments from them? Uh, just a comment from me. So Percy, I'm married to a coal geologist. And in 20 years, he has not been able to explain it to me as well as you just have done. So thank you very much. <laughs> maybe, maybe one gen general, general question from, from me. Um, you, you've in the in the example you've you've given you the checkerboard extraction method method is the one that's being used and is the one that's probably most sensible. Mm -hmm. But if you take the coal field as a whole, um, is the checkerboard method the most commonly used? And given that, how much ultimately how much coal is left behind? How much of the resources that has to be left behind after pillar extraction? Are you dealing with 10%, 5%, 20%? So like uh, for, for companies like, um, I think it's Travis Stock, I just, I'm just not sure. They're using Navit, like a lot of companies that have the machinery and or they already planned that as they'll retreat, they will, as they, they finish their primary extraction, they will retreat. They've, they can use the, the, the plus splitting. So it's really common that they use your split and friender and your, your, your Navit, especially with Sasson mines. I think they use Navit. So they're doing pillar splitting compared to a, a small miner or a company that has never done pillar extraction. Then I think that's why you would use checkerboard. But in, uh, the question that you ask, if we're using Navit, you are, most probably gonna mine almost more than 70 or 80 to 90. So that I think we, we can we can extract 80 to 90 of the remaining resources, but depending on the the company, is it a large scale company, is it a big company? Have they already planned it? But if you're speaking for those companies that like you have never planned that you mine using second, you you will not mine the pillars. Then I think then they'll take maybe 50%. That means will remain, the 25 percent will remain on the ground. Because already you have taken 50, you have taken 50 using your Roman pillar, then you will take 50 of the pillars, then you remain with 50, which will be 25. So I think depending on the kind of company, is it a large scale or a small scale, do they have expertise and all that? That's quite crucial. That's one thing I hadn't realized. Um, size and technical capabilities of the company. Mm. That's very important. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, Percy, with that, I'd like to close the meeting. Uh, we'll have the YouTube video up uh, next week sometime. So thank you very much. Um, Nolene, would you like to say anything at this stage? I just want to thank Percy for doing the talk and um, for the guys attending and guys have a fantastic weekend. Okay, thank, thank you. So
Thank you. I'll close the meeting now. Thanks a lot, Percy. All right. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.